Good morning to you all and welcome to our World of Mission service this morning. I trust that what you see and hear during the service will lead to an increased awareness of missions in general and more specifically to missions through Trinity. We at Trinity are very grateful that James Burnett has stepped into the gap to lead the missions ministry at Trinity and we look forward to an increased interest in and support of missions under his guidance. It's with great sadness that this morning we record the death of Bob Benjamin on Friday afternoon after a difficult period in hospital for a number of weeks. To Pat, Marguerite and the family, our loving sympathies at this difficult time, we're praying peace and the assurance of God's loving arms around you to comfort you. I'm going to invite you as a congregation to join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of dedicated service to extending God's kingdom that we saw in Bob. We thank you for his enthusiasm for the cause that you called him and Pat to, and for their obedience in difficult circumstances. We now particularly commit Pat and Marguerite and the rest of the family into your hands. Pray that they will know the miraculous peace that you can give and that they will know your comfort during these difficult times of parting. We ask this in your name. Amen. Bob and Pat's work uh, would have been a feature of this service. And so we would like to dedicate the entire service today to the memory and the example of Bob in his work for God. Can I then remind you too that later in this service, James will lead us in the observance of communion. Then, moving on to birthday wishes for this week, our congratulations go to Sia Busakwe, who has his birthday today. Afakili has Sekwebu, has his birthday on Tuesday. Shamel Daniels celebrates on Thursday. And then Yvonne Tharrett has her birthday on Saturday. Congratulations and best wishes to all these folk. And it's our prayer that in the year ahead, you will walk close to God. Those in the church family that are struggling with health issues at the moment would be very encouraged if they knew that the church family was praying for them. And so specifically, we ask you to remember Charles Hayes as he recuperates from his gallbladder surgery. And then will you remember Nigel Webb as he commences a treatment after his visit to a specialist physician during this past week. Here's a reminder about our Zoom prayer meeting on Tuesday evening at six o'clock. If you can manage the technology, it would be really great if you could join us then. And if you can't manage the technology, why don't you set aside that time, six o'clock, and join us in spirit as we pray together. And won't you use the prayer focus that will appear that morning as a guide for your prayer. Senior Youth, or as it's known now, Lit for Life, recommences on Friday of this week. They'll have their first meeting at 5 o'clock, 1700 hours in the church hall. So all of the young folk in the teenage high school age group are welcome to attend that first get-together. Next Sunday's service will feature our Awakened Hearts ministry, which seeks to promote work amongst adoption and orphan care. You will recall the special appeal that we had towards the end of last year for baby care goods that went to Tundasana Home in Newton Park. And then we also supported them with part of our thank offering 
in November last year. We'll have a guest preacher for that service, and that will be the person of Reverend Bradley Jones from our Jeffreys Bay Church. As per the announcement during last week about reopening of services, next week's service will, like today's, also be a pre-recorded one available on YouTube from 9.30 for you to watch whenever it suits you. And then the plan will be to open our services to a congregation, which will not be allowed to be more than 50 folk, to attend from Sunday the 21st of February onwards. A reminder that at this stage, uh, your tithes and offerings can be processed through the EFT system. If you don't have the church's bank account particulars at your fingertips, then please have a look at the church website. That detail will be found there. And our grateful thanks to all of those who have faithfully continue to support the church through their tithes and offerings. As we mentioned last week, we'll have a slot each week in the service for our Trinity kids, previously Sunday school. So now it's over to Imran Jacobs for our Trinity kids corner this morning. Thanks, Imran. Hi, good morning, Trinity Baptists. This is a special message today for our Trinity Kids Corner, for the little ones at Trinity Baptist. Today, we will be touching on our missions journey, because this is an international missionary service for the little ones. Now, today I'm going to touch on the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Now, kids... The Apostle Paul was not only an apostle, but he was also a missionary. So the Apostle Paul used to go to a lot of places for Jesus. Okay, On his first and his second journey, he traveled far. He traveled. And then he ended up on his third journey because he was sent by the church of Antioch. That was his base church, his mother church. They sent him on his third journey. And that was to the area of Macedonia and Greece. It's right here on this world map, as you can see. Now, the Apostle Paul was a very obedient apostle to the word of Christ. He decided he was going to visit a town in Ephesus. Now, in this town of Ephesus, he stayed there for three years. While he was staying in Ephesus, while busy with his mission, he used to visit a school, it's called the School of Tyrannus, where he taught all children about the gospel of Christ. Now that was the Apostle Paul, a very kind and gentle-hearted person. He, every day, he met in the synagogues, he met with the schools, and he taught about basic discipleship, how to save souls for Jesus. Now, some, there was a lot of miracles that took place in the book of Acts. And it, is, and it is believed that a lot of the people in the town got so convinced by the preaching and the spreading of the gospel of the Apostle Paul that they stopped believing in idols. They turned their backs on idols. They stopped buying idols. Okay? They turned from sorcery and they turned to God. Now, this was very good for Christianity, for Apostle Paul, for the town of Ephesus. But there was a silversmith in town by the name of Demetrius and he was very cross because now nobody bought idols. Everybody was turning to God and he didn't make a profit. So he led a riot against Apostle Paul. And children stole the gospel of God came through even though there was a riot, but nothing happened to the Apostle Paul because it was God's word that got spoken. Now God did many extraordinary things in the life of Apostle Paul so that even 
people with handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched them. They took it to other people in the towns and those people got healed. Demons ran off, they fled away because of the power of God in the Apostle Paul. He was a true missionary. And I believe in today's days, children, that to be a missionary, that is what God expects, named basically from all of us. He expects each and every one of us kids, whether it's in school, whether it's on the sports ground, whether you go into a mall, you sit with friends, that is mission work. If you speak about Jesus to your friends, if you talk to them, if you invite them to a Sunday school service, if you invite them to a, a Christian event, that is part of mission work. That is what Apostle Paul did. And that was encouragement of the Church of Antioch in the time to lead people to Jesus. And I believe in today's day, missionary work should, missionary work should actually be the center point of our lives. Yes, we come to church on a Sunday. Yes, we fellowship. We worship. But children, to do missionary work is where you touch people outside that never heard of God, that never had an experience with God. You know. But in true missionary work, that, I've, that is what, from my personal point of view, that is what I find. That is what God wants us to do. That's where God's spirit lies to those it still needs salvation. Now, children, I am going to bring this to a close. Um, now, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said that we should not live in fear. So, we do not need to be scared when, we, when we're in the school ground, break time, to speak to a person, to speak to a fellow, a, a friend, or to a friend's friend, because God commands us not to have a fear of spirit. God is a God of love and of kindness. So if you take that to the, to the sports field, if you take that at break at school or to the mall or to the beach, wherever you are, that is what God intends us to do. Now God is above and beyond all powers. And that Satan streaks cannot work where God's power lies. I have a final thought for you, Trinity Kids Corner, this morning. All of these special miracles help all these people in the town of Ephesus to understand that God's Spirit is for everyone who chooses to follow and obey Him. Now, with that said, children, I want to thank you for listening to me. I want you to take this message to heart this morning and I want you to, to make work of it. Please make work of it. And if you don't know how to make work of it, ask us. Our Sunday school teachers are here. Uncle Jason is here. We are all here to guide and help one another to lead more disciples to Christ.
Good morning and thank you very much to Lucretia and the worship team for those wonderful songs of worship. So welcome to Trinity Baptist Church this morning and we trust that you will enjoy the rest of your time with us as we celebrate and worship together. And this morning we celebrate missions and our theme this morning is the world of missions and we trust that you will enjoy hearing from all our missionaries. Our purpose statement here at Trinity is knowing Jesus and making him known. And Lord, we just want you to be made known, not only in our city, but around the world. So we know that those of you who have a, a heart for missions at Trinity, we'd just like to invite you to contact me. And if you would like to be involved in a group, that would be able to uh, promote missions, be interested in missions, discuss missions, then it would be nice if we could form a group. And if you've got any ideas, also to contact me so we can actually get on and uh, promote missions and support our missionaries better. So please, if you're interested, please do contact me. So I'll trust that you'll be really encouraged this morning and uplifted as we hear from our missionaries. But let's just first open with a word of prayer and this morning I'm going to use a psalm, Psalm 67. It's known as the Great Commission of the Old Testament and that's going to be our theme this morning, the, the commission, the Great Commission that Jesus gave us, yes, his followers to do. So let's pray. May you, O Father, be gracious to us and bless us and make your face to shine upon us. And may your ways be known on earth and your salvation to all nations. May the people praise you, O God. May all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the people justly and you guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest and God our God will bless us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. So we just commit everything that's said and done this morning, Lord, into your hands. And bless us, we pray. For we ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. Well, today is World's Missions uh, Service here at Trinity. And we trust that you would be blessed by what we've put together for you this morning. If there are any of those at Trinity who are interested in missions or have ideas about how we can promote missions, I we'll ask that you please uh, get in touch with me and we can put together a group and work on it so we can advance the cause of missions around the world. So thank you for that. And I trust today that you've been encouraged and uplifted by the reports of some of our missionaries that they have kindly sent us. But this morning, our hearts are very sad at the loss and passing on of one of our missionaries, uh, Bobby Benjamin, Bob Benjamin. And so we'd like to just 
pray for him at this time. We were hoping to get a report from him, but he's been sick, and the Lord has called him home to his reward. Our Father, we are saddened and our hearts are heavy at uh, your calling home of your faithful servant, Bobby Benjamin, who so faithfully served you and loved you and was so enthusiastic about preaching your gospel. And Lord, we know that he is now in a place where there is no suffering and he's rejoicing with you in heaven. But Lord, we just pray that you would be with the family that is left behind here and hearts are broken and are sorrowing and have this loss at this time. We pray, Lord, that you would be their comfort. Comfort them and strengthen them in these days. So we just commit them, Father, into your heavenly hands. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Okay, so we have some reports this morning. We're going to go through them in alphabetical order. And we, the first two are the Burnets, us, and then... From then we go into the funnels who are involved in Bible translation. Good day, we are James and Lynn who are serving the Lord with Transworld Radio. I'm a technical project manager and very grateful that I can work from home in these days. And Lynn is very much still involved with TWR Women of Hope. Thank you Trinity Baptist for supporting us for all these 38 years that we've been with Transworld Radio. What is Transworld Radio? Transworld Radio is answering the call to reach the world for Christ through media so that lasting fruit can be produced. Now Transworld Radio speaks in 275 languages and dialects in 190 countries. My big project these recent years has been the new transmitter in West Africa and I'm glad to report that it's now fully operational and running at 150 kilowatts and we're really grateful that the Lord has answered all of our prayers. Recently we received a little story from Rabio, the chief technician who I worked with on the station. He said the other day he was on his way home when someone at the toll gate stopped him. He knew this guy from town and had laughed at him because Rabio was going to church. He is a Muslim. And a while ago, Rabio had given him a radio so he could listen to transfer radio. And he stopped him to say that he was enjoying the radio programs, especially through the Bible. And it was a great blessing to him and to his friends. I'm doing what I can, though many things like visiting women's groups are not possible during COVID. Some of the women are still listening to the Women of Hope programs on the audio devices and also praying using the monthly prayer calendars, which of course can continue. Thank you from James and I for your support and please do continue to pray for us. God bless. Hello, um, my name is Barry Funnell and this is my wife Julia. Hi. Uh, we are missionaries with the Word for the World Bible Translators and we are greeting you from the UK as we were living at the moment. And we just want to thank you as a church for your support, such faithful support over many years. Thank you. For our work of Bible translation. And now the Word for the World is a very specialized organization because we do pioneer Bible translation. We translate the Word of God into languages that have never had Scripture before. And believe it or not, there are 7,300 languages spoken in the world today. Over 4,000, or roughly 4,000, still don't have any Scripture at all. So there's still a lot of work to be done. 10% of the world, world's languages have a full Bible, which is, uh, it, it regards to about 5 million sorry, 5 billion people. So it's a lot of people that have the word, but there's still millions and millions that have never had any scripture at all. 30% have New Testaments in world languages. But So there's still a lot of work to be done. Now the word for the world has a vision to see God glorified by his word being made available in everybody's heart language and their lives being transformed through it. And we have a goal to do 500 languages as an organization 
And so far, we've got 130 languages that have been started over the last 40 years. It's our 40th anniversary this year. And we thank God for the progress that we're making. We have seven full Bibles uh, on the press at the moment, two completed already, and 35 New Testaments. So God is blessing our work, and we thank you for your prayers. Uh, Julia's going to briefly tell you about her work. Well, um, I'm working as the editor for the training department, and that involves um, proofreading, editing, and chasing up people for the uh, training that we have. There's 30 uh, subjects that I have to keep an eye on and about 400 students doing the course. So that's fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And I am a consultant working uh, with the Word for the World and actually looking after the consultants as a director of the consulting services. So thank you for your interest and may God bless you. Bye bye. Thank you very much for those reports to see what God is doing around the world and the wonderful work of Bible translation. Next up we have the Jolly family who serve the Lord here in Port Elizabeth amongst other people group and we'll hear what they are doing and then from the Lamb family who serve you faithfully in Hong Kong. Greetings Trinity family. We are Alistair and Carmelita Jolly serving with SIN in Southern Africa. First things first, Thank you for your faithful support since 1990 in Pastor Martin Palman's time. Amen. The various mission boards have been very good in keeping in touch. Being one of the few missionary couples at home, we enjoyed attending the various missions prayer meetings and prayer breakfasts. Amber always spoiled our children with crumpets and cheese, rolls and pate. The Burnett seniors and their team were amazing. Apart from Westway, we certainly got to know our Trinity family fairly well. Natalie, Dick and Anna Truth Burster kept us informed with regular news from Trinity. Our main areas of responsibility are Muslim evangelism, convert care and discipleship. We've been blessed in ministry through SIM in PE. Beginning in 1989, we did on-the-job training while doing door-to-door -door outreach with Godly Church members in the northern areas of Port Elizabeth. Although Muslim, the Muslim population in South Africa is small, around 2%, the influence is far larger. The stated agenda is to make South Africa an Islamic state, where non-Muslims would be second-class citizens. The gift of the givers are very prominent due to the humanitarian aid they give in times of crisis, e.g. famine, stroke drought relief, and medical assistance in the COVID time. The majority of their funding for their projects comes from your food budget through the Halal Mark. Muslims occupy many influential positions in South Africa. The Minister of Home Affairs, the Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition, the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, and many more. Currently, I'm more involved in general evangelism while building relationship with expat Muslims, Muslim shop owners. Please pray for wisdom in finding new areas of ministry. Good morning, Trinity Baptist Church. Thank you so much for all the years of supporting us. This is Rod Lam in Hong Kong. Oh, Julie and I are part of the China and Beyond uh, uh, team, but we are also part of the UCM, which is um, Urban City Ministries. We are based in Hong Kong, which is roughly 8 million people, but we also have a lot of ministry across the border. Um, our team consists of approximately uh, just over 100 in, uh, people, including children, of which about 60, over 60 are adults. We're a very multicultural group from a variety of continents, probably, st uh, sp 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 probably making up all six continents. Um, most of my ministry is done across the border, but of course we cannot travel there at the moment, as you all know from the COVID. Um, we've been doing a lot of our ministry through Zoom or online streaming, and uh, we previously had three groups, um, but one of the groups belonging to a large IT company have their own platform at the moment, 
So two of the groups uh, we meet regularly on a Monday and a Tuesday evening and we've been currently going through the book of Nehemiah and different topics. Um, the 12 in the one Monday evening group and the Tuesday group varies between anything between 6 and 9 or, and two other colleagues have been helping in the Tuesday group. Um, one of the things that you, you'd asked about Hong Kong, well Hong Kong as you probably know is a very small area. For those of you who are spatial people, Hong Kong is, is roughly 1200 square kilometers. You could, you could, for South Africans who know about the Kruger Park, you could probably put about um, 30 Hong Kong into the Kruger Park. So that gives you something of the dynamics and the size. Uh, what is it, it like for a day in Hong Kong? Well, it's, it's very crowded. And so many of us are rely, reliant on the transport and the travel that we have here in Hong Kong. Um, at the moment, many of us try to avoid the, the rush hours. So we, in the office, we come in at staggered hours. We don't have a full office because um, government regulations don't want us to have a, a full office. So we very seldom have more than 50% in at the same time. Um, I work with great colleagues and I'm in the office. I'm also part of the human resource um, support team. And once more, just thank you all for your prayers, your support. And please remember our UCM team, as I said, the over 100 uh, adults and children. We will have a live streaming from the 30th to the, of January to the 6th of February for our first ever virtual conference. It's hard to believe this is our season of conferences for our various groups. Um, we'll all be meeting at different times um, because, um, for example, as I look at the sheet before me, some in Bangkok will meet at 7 p.m., the China folk at 8 p.m., the Sydney folk at 11 p.m., the U.S. Pacific at 4 a.m., in Central at 6 a.m., and London at 12 noon. So bear with us in our, the Year of the Ox. Greetings. Thank you. Thank you. Good to hear from the lambs and their family and their work that they are doing over in that faraway part of the world. And then our last two, Jenny Meyer, who was here earlier and serving with the children's mission. We're going to hear a bit about her work. And then uh, Cecil and Jeanette Peasley will be give us a report. Imagine parents and children living in deep, trusting relationships. Imagine families where old and young serve each other with respect and love. Imagine a society where all say to one another, you are special and valued. Many centuries ago, the prophet Malachi saw the day of the Lord coming. The Lord showed him a new society, one of hope, joy and peace. A society where the hearts of the parents had turned to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Seasoned children's ministry workers, all with a change of heart. If it is true that children are special in God's eyes, that we are very willing to accept and serve Him, why do churches give so little attention to us? Back in the 1980s, Reverend Johan de Preer and a group of friends were asking the same question. Why do Christian leaders give so little attention to children? They were particularly concerned about the continent of Africa. The problem, they decided, is that church leaders don't know God's heart for children and don't know how to deal with children. The answer? Train them and show them how to train others. So, on the 1st of April 1989, Child Evangelist Training Institute was founded, which eventually became Petra Institute for Children's Ministry. We find partners in poor rural areas, in cities, in war zones, wherever children are at risk, and then help them to develop strategies to bring change in these children's lives. 
The first step is to equip a core group of leaders to do relational children's ministry in their own context. Then we show them how to train others and eventually to train trainers of others. And so the numbers multiply and the movement grows. We continue listening, advising and encouraging as mentors and friends. But the partners are the new owners of the process. Petra Institute has already developed partnerships in 29 countries with trained children's workers in more than 60 countries. Yes, friends, I came to Christ at the age of 15. It was a wonderful life-transforming experience. And shortly after that, while working in a Youth for Christ uh, crusade up in Johannesburg, one night while praying, the Lord uh, seemed to really lay a particular verse upon my heart. It was found in Romans chapter 9, verse 17, that said, For this purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power through you, and my name be declared throughout all the nations. And this verse, although it's in an Old Testament context, it, it, it just sprang out and gripped my heart. And I sensed this was a call to world evangelism. Where, when, I did not know, but all I knew was at that particular moment to say yes to him, to sign the check as it were, and say I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll be what you want me to be. Well, I had to finish school, went, through, went to work to raise money to go to college and went to attend the Baptist Theological College and upon graduation from there, pastored different uh, churches for a period of 14 years and then served uh, as a mission director in different organizations that were in the country and yet these were merely administrative jobs even though they were related to world evangelism. But then there came the time in 1992 when both Jeanette and I felt a very strong call to launch out in faith and to trust God to open the doors and go to the uttermost parts of the earth. It was the great Oswald Smith that once said, Why should some hear the gospel twice when others have never heard it once? And so by faith, without any money, without any meetings, without any plans, we resigned, we launched out, and God began to open doors. Within two months, I was in Russia, and then from then to every continent of the world in 39 different countries, it's been our privilege to take the gospel and, and preach the gospel and conduct leadership and training courses and spiritual warfare conferences with men and women, pastors and people from every language, every kindred, every tribe, every culture, and find how the gospel prevails across it all. We don't know how long we've got in this ministry, but we thank God for it. And even though the uh, the, the the COVID has uh, has has, uh, has has restricted things, it's been our joy to serve as interim pastor at the Trinity Baptist Church. We trust that God will continue to use in whatever way He chooses to His glory and to His honor. We thank God for this. I thank God for Jeanette for the way she has stood with me and uh, encouraged me and supported in every single way, sometimes at tremendous sacrifice. But thank God for a wife that is so committed to Jesus first and then to the extension of his kingdom. Thank you for your prayers. May God give Trinity a continued vision for world missions like never before. Yes, what a privilege it is to serve the Lord, especially just to support my husband. I don't like lying up in the front. And... Um, I do all the admin work. Sometimes I travel with him, um, but it's too much really. And um, staying at home and doing the admin is a good background job. I always say, yeah, I wanted to be an evangelist, but the Lord had other plans. He gave me an evangelist and he told me in an uncertain manner that my role was to support. So I always say to Cecil, oh, well, you just go and preach. I have to do all the work. Not true, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Okay, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you to Jenny and to the Peasleys. And so thank you very much for those reports. I would trust that you were really blessed by them. 
So this morning I would like to have a look at the Great Commission as it's found in the four Gospels. A couple of months after we arrived back in the Bay, our pastor at the time, Keith, invited all of us at Trinity to go along to a missions conference called Activate. And a group of us went along. And there I heard for the first time the initials DMM. And I didn't even know what they stood for. But we learned that it stood for Disciple Making Movement. And we were, got excited about this and learned a lot about it. What God is doing around the world through this new movement. And thousands and thousands of churches have been started in India, for example, through the Disciple Making Movement. And I know Bongani, we started a little life group, we called it, with Bongani and Bongiwe and others. And we decided to try and put this into practice. <laughs> and so this whole of last year, 2020, we've been following a series of Bible studies uh, along this series of Disciple Making Movement. And we studied in the book of Matthew. You know, Jesus started off his ministry by preaching a very simple message. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And his followers, he started to teach them and to make them into true disciples. And so through the year, we learned more and more little bits about how Jesus taught his disciples. But then when it came to the end, when Jesus entered Jerusalem for one of the last times, uh, and then when they were leaving Jerusalem, because Jesus never slept in Jerusalem it seems, his disciples said to him, Lord, look at these magnificent buildings. And they were magnificent, the temple and all the buildings around it. Herod had spent 47 years building them, and I believe they were covered in white marble. And when the sun shone, people from miles around could see the temple on the temple mount. But Jesus said, I tell you the truth. At one of these days, not one of these stones will be standing upon another. And his disciples were shocked. And later on, when they were sitting on the Mount of Olives, they asked Jesus this question. When will this happen? And what will be the signs of your coming at the end of the age? They thought if the temple got destroyed, everything would come to an end. But Jesus explained to them in Matthew, he said to them and he, that these things all need to happen before the end can come. And one of the things that he told them that must happen before the end comes, he says that this gospel this gospel of the kingdom of God must be preached in the whole world as a testimony to me. And only then can the end come. That this gospel must be preached as a testimony to all peoples, every people group. And only then will the end come. And later on we're going to be celebrating communion together. And I'll come back to this passage a little later on. But later that week, Jesus was crucified and died for our sins, went to the cross and died. And then he rose again. And then we ended up last year in our Bible study reading Matthew chapter 28 verse 16 where he gives them their commission. And this is what we read, Matthew chapter 8, 28 verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and in earth is being given to me. Therefore you go and make disciples. You go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you. Surely I will be with you until 
the very end of this age. Nations, there is people groups. In South Africa, we have what? 11, 11 <laughs> official languages. People groups. And it's good to know we were hearing from Barry about Bible translation. But here in South Africa, I believe Bible translation is complete. All of the language groups, the 11, have Bibles in their own language. But here Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. Now where is the Great Commission found in the other Gospels? So if we turn to Mark, at the end of Mark, chapter 16, let's see if we can find it there. Aha, yes, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus tells his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creatures. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But those who do not believe will be condemned. A commissioning at the end of Mark. And then Luke. Uh -huh, let's look at the end of Luke. What did Luke say when at the end? Well, if we look at Luke, 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 we don't find anything. Did he forget about the Great Commission? No, no. Uh, remember, Luke wrote Acts as well. And so he gave the Great Commission in the beginning of the book of Acts. <laughs> in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read. Here, he says, Jesus said to his disciples just before the ascension, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. In our Jerusalem, in our Judea, in our Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. I think the Jolly family are working here in PE, but they're working in our Samaria. <laughs> they're trying to reach out to other people. And so it's, it's great that we should be involved in missions, not in the, only in our Jerusalem, here in the church, in the area around, in the next lot of people groups, but to the very ends of the earth. So that was Luke. And then in John, where do we find the Great Commission? We find the Great Commission here in John chapter 20, verse 21. And the disciples were locked in the room where they had had celebrated the Passover together, the Lord's Supper together. And they were a week later or that same night, Jesus appeared to them. And he said to them, peace be with you, because they were afraid. Peace be with you. And then he sent to them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. For if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas was there was not there. He was one of the twelve. Thomas, dear Thomas, I want to tell you in my mission work, this last week I've been working with my friend in India on a radio project, and I met Shakti many, many years ago through Transworld Radio, and I asked him, Shakti, is it true that Thomas, Thomas ended up in India? <laughs> and he said, yes, Thomas, there's a church called the Thomas Church in the southern part of India, even to this day. And I said, wow, is that so? Yes, you know, Thomas. Thomas took Jesus' message seriously. It seems, I can't imagine how he just started walking, Thomas, up through Samaria, Syria, across Iraq, Iran, over Pakistan, and ended up through India, down in South India, where he spent 20 years there and finally was martyred for his faith by going and telling and making disciples. Dear Thomas. So that's the Great Commission in the four Gospels. Now, how can you be involved in missions, you may ask? I'm too old to go or can't go, this and that. You may have lots of excuses. But how can you be involved in missions? 
Well, there's three things. You can go, you can give, or you can pray. And so, we would like you to get involved somehow. If you can't go, well then at least you can support missionaries, which you are doing. And I think uh, Dr. Kevin's been telling you about the FBO, to give to our FBO, Faith Promise Offerings, so that we can support the missionaries and mission work and praying for them. And if you want to pray more earnestly for missionaries, then please, we're hoping to have the missionary prayer letters available for you in the coming months when church gets open again, or contact me, and we can send you more details so you can pray, particularly for our missionaries. So thank you. We're going to now move on to a time of communion, and then we'll close in prayer. Thank you. So let us uh, celebrate the communion together as the Lord commanded us to do. I trust you have your elements ready with you, the bread and the cup, and so we can eat and drink together. So let us pray. Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be kept holy. And Father, we do pray for those people who are shut in, and who are sick. Dr. Kevin mentioned them all in the announcements, Lord, and we've had them on WhatsApp. We pray again for them, Lord, that you would strengthen them and be with them. And those who are struggling because of this COVID pandemic, whether through loneliness, anxiety, or unemployment, we pray, Lord, that you would meet their needs at this time as we remember the family. And Lord, we come in these unusual circumstances to this communion service, and we will trust in your great mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs from fall from your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy and on that we depend. So Lord, feed us with this bread and the cup that we may forever live in you and that you may live in us. Last month, Afakila read from Matthew, and I want to read from that as well because it fits in so much with what we've been talking about, making disciples and the disciple-making movement. Because here, Jesus in the upper room in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, he says, While they were eating the Last Supper together, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And this morning we've been talking about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus told us to go out and grow the kingdom till it fills the whole world. And he's not coming back until everybody is heard. And here Jesus says, that I will not drink again. In other words, he won't have this communion until one day he sits down with us in his kingdom and we have it together. I think that is so wonderful. And so as we celebrate what Jesus has done for us and remember what he's done for us on the cross, let us remember to go and make disciples. His body represents his life and his death. And his life, he taught us, he lived us, lived and taught us how to live. And that bread represents that. So let us now take our bread and our pr we'll do it separately this time. You got your bread. Let me uh, pray or say the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance 
that Christ died for you and for me. And feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. Let us eat together. And then Jesus took the cup. This represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you and for me. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and for me, and be thankful. So let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us with this sacrament. And we do it in obedience to your command to remember you. We pray that you will unite us with Christ. And give us a foretaste of that one day, that heavenly blanket that you have prepared for those who love you. And we look forward to the day when we will sit down with you and drink from the fruit of the vine in your Father's kingdom. Come soon, Lord Jesus, we pray. So, Father, now, just go before us and be with us as we go into this new week. May the peace of the Lord be with us in these days. Amen. Sweet.